Father, thank you for the grace that it is to sing your praises, to sing of your sufficiency, to sing of your grace, your goodness and your kindness to us. Lord, we, we want to um, give you all praise, glory, and honor, and we want to acknowledge that how you've even stirred up our hearts to want to follow you more and to a greater degree and with greater zeal, with greater faithfulness. This is um, all for your glory. And as you grant those longings that we just sang about, and as you answer these prayers, we'll be able to look back and in the very near future, we'll be, look, we'll be looking back at answers to prayer and, and, and gratified longings that uh, turned out in successful, faithful following after you in, in the path that you have blazed in front of us. And, and we'll be able to look back and see obedience and see joy and see yieldedness and see Christ-likeness formed in our lives and be able to say that this is indeed your doing. We'll give you all the credit and all the glory and all the honor for what you alone could produce as we strive to follow you. So Lord, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, I do pray that your truth would continue to equip us. Your word is, is going to not only show us your glory in the way that we need to see you rightly, but especially this morning, it will show us rightly the way we need to see ourselves. And so I do pray that it would have its quickening effect, that it would produce uh, fruit, and that we would leave here changed, not in some sort of mystical moment, but by way of conviction, that we would walk out of here changed. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> Thanks for your singing this morning. Isn't it great how singing corporately is always a ministry one to another? You know, Paul says, you sing, we're singing to the Lord, we're worshiping the Lord, but you're singing to one another. So, you know, the louder you're singing, the more you're singing to me and me to you. So, some of you are ministering to me much more than I would be to you if I were singing right in your ear. But nevertheless, the content still ministers to me. I just love that. I love that aspect of corporate worship. So, I'm very grateful for that. I want to begin this morning looking back at what we've already looked at in Mark for a moment. We're actually not going to be in Mark this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 51. I think you'll see why. I want to explain why if it's not immediately obvious. Look at Mark chapter 1. This is where we've been in this introduction. Mark's introduction to his gospel. It goes from verse 1 through verse 15. And it's, it's really bookended by the preaching of repentance. First of all, notice in verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Then when you skip down to verses 14 and 15, after Jesus, Jesus has begun his earthly ministry, Mark can summarize Jesus' entire preaching ministry with two verbs, really. Verse 14 says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Specifically, repent and believe in the gospel of God, as he describes it in verse 14. Repentance and faith. This is a critical message. In fact, this is the summary of Jesus' entire earthly ministry uh, by the inspired pen of Paul through the eyewitness account of um, inspired account of Mark through the eyewitness account of Peter. Now the reason why I want to take a brief pause on our exposition of Mark is not because there's anything lacking in Mark. Mark lacks nothing. Uh, in fact, what's so profound about Mark is that as we get to especially chapters 8 through 10, Jesus is going to walk the disciples through three chapters of training them in what it looks like to believe the gospel of God and to live out repentance. And so there's, there's literally no lack in Mark. This is not because of uh, any other reason than the fact that I'm a little anxious to get to some of those truths, and I don't want to skip the rest of what's between you know, verse 16 and chapter 8. And so uh, I, I was thinking about it, and I thought, you know, what would be really helpful for us is a little bit of a template, 
a, a, a brief pause where we could look at some scripture together as a church and examine what would it look like to live out repentance and faith. When Mark can summarize Jesus' message, repent and believe the gospel, that is the fundamentals of Christianity. Think about this. This is the arrival of God's own son, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the word of God. I mean, think about that very label, the word of God. He is the expression of God. He is the living sermon of God the Father, and his message is very clear. Repent and believe the gospel. Um, you, you're familiar, if you're a sports fan, you're familiar of uh, the famous coach Vince Lombardi. So after they lost the Super Bowl to the Eagles in 61, they come back for spring training, and there they are, and he starts with the fundamentals. He holds out a football and says, gentlemen, this is a football. He goes back to the fundamentals because he knew that was critical for them to do better the following year, and then, they, of course, they turn around and win the Super Bowl that year. In Christianity, I think we've lost sight of the fundamentals. It's as though Christ himself are saying, Christian, this is Christianity. And he's holding out repentance and faith. Here's the fundamentals. This is essential, the non-negotiable, for what it means to follow after me. Uh, We've lost sight of the fundamentals. We've lost, we're, we're embarrassed by them. We ignore them. We neglect them. Or we just disagree with them. It would probably be difficult for me to point to examples of Christianity where large Christian movements as a whole would reject those fundamentals outright. That's that's actually quite uncommon. It's more common that we would just neglect them, never talk about them, practice ministry and live life in such a way that we would neglect the implications of what it really means to believe, what it really means to repent. Let me develop this a little bit to try to clarify what I'm, what I'm getting at here. Whether we like it or not, you know, we've been, most of us have been very affected by, uh, and for, for lack of a better term, American evangelicalism. And um, I trust that that's a vague enough term to be utterly useless. So, <laughs> it's like, what does that even mean? But I think we could probably all agree that there's this general Protestant, Trinitarian, Christian type of religious impetus in our culture that highlights and gladly talks about the name Jesus Christ and would generally be zealous to influence the world around us for better. And I think that's hopefully innocuous and general enough to describe everybody in this American evangelicalism. I trust that's a broad enough description to include Christians who are so broken over their sins that they desperately want everyone around them to hear about the only Savior, Jesus Christ, who could possibly atone for their sins, provide righteousness, and prepare them for eternity. But it's also a broad enough description to include those quote-unquote Christians who believe that too much talk about sin is a distraction. It's a distraction from the greatness of Christ. It's a distraction from uh, the discussion of forgiveness. And, and they, they want salvation from the curse. They want to increase human flourishing. They want to make sure that everyone around them can enjoy better lives now. And hopefully that the world will recognize that uh, Jesus is actually quite attractive and they should be able to embrace him. And he'll meet some of their natural needs. That, of course, is a man-made Christianity. It's interesting, though, that rightly identifying the problem is what divides the man-made Christianity from the biblical Christianity. What is the problem? What's the real problem? What's man's greatest need? What's his greatest problem? If man's greatest need is his awful crime against the living God of living for self-glory rather than for God's glory, then the solution requires rescue from God's wrath. It requires the gift of divine righteousness. If the problem, though, is People in the world don't find the Christ revealed in the scripture as relevant as the religious person would want. Well, then the solution is a more attractive Christ. The solution is um, a Christ who offers man what they naturally want. If the greatest problem is a, a perceived irrelevance, that we're irrelevant because all we do is talk about Christ and sin, and sin is embarrassing, and it's constant exposure, and it's just constantly grates against the flesh, and 
no unbeliever is ever attracted to that type of Christ, well then, the problem is that the church is being marginalized, and Christians aren't gaining a stronger foothold or getting a louder voice in the public square. And so typically here, with that, if that's the problem, the path forward is increasing human flourishing, making the world a better place, promoting philanthropy, and of course, those are the philanthropies which are also man-centered forms of philanthropy, not a Christian form of philanthropy. Scriptures are very clear. If we are not regularly training our senses, that's flexing the sensitivity muscle of our discernment faculty, to constantly discern right from wrong, we will not need the Christ of the Scriptures. The Bible says so, specifically in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Unless we are regularly exercising the discernment muscle to recognize what's right and what's wrong about what's going on inside my inner man, I will actually grow to the point where I won't need the Christ of Scripture. I just need some generic solution. I'm always impressed whenever I um, am, uh, somebody's kind of, you know, disgruntled with my ministry, whether it's counseling or preaching or whatever, and they say, man, pastor, you know, your problem is, is that you just talk about sin too much. I just, I love that, I love that accusation. <laughs> Such a great accusation. I feel like if I get that accusation, okay, whew, hopefully, I think I'm being faithful. Could that ever be a true accusation? Well, sure, that could actually be a true accusation. That could be a legitimate accusation. How would you know? Well, you would know if your emphasis on sin is outside of biblical balance. You would know that if you're just a morose person, you don't have any joy, and you're constantly beating the drum of, oh, I'm just a horrible sinner, and there's no joy in your life, then you know you're imbalanced. But if your balance comes from the text of Scripture, and the emphasis on sin is a biblical emphasis on sin, then it's never too much. Because until there's a biblical emphasis on sin, there will be no joy in Christ. There will be no need for the Christ whose simple message is repent and believe in the gospel. And we have an American Christianity that can gladly has all these other needs. They have all these other Christs that fit the bill for their problem, not the Christ revealed in the scriptures. And so, as I look at the problem and I look at my concern about the, 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 the glory of Christ in the American church, and I look at the glory of Christ in this church, the need is not some massive movement, some massive donor, some massive intellect, some, you name it, fill in the blank. You know what the need is? If Christ is going to get his proper glory from this congregation, the need is individuals living out repentance and faith every day. The need is the individual Christian who is following Christ on the way. And so the question then becomes, what does it look like? For a Christian who has turned from a lifestyle of sin, joined himself to the church, but then still on a daily basis sees sin in their soul. I mean, this is critical because this is where we all live. Unless we are totally deluded or blind, this is where we all live. We are, if we're professing to follow Christ, if we're pursuing him, and we know we have not arrived, we are on a path following Christ in the midst of our brokenness, what does it look like to live out repentance and faith? And that's why I wanted to turn to Psalm 51 this morning. So grab your Bibles and turn over to Psalm 51. Because honestly, this is, this is it's almost like this is a lost art. Studying Psalm 51 goes back to the fundamentals that Jesus tells us about in Mark 1.15. And it's a model given to us by King David. And honestly, Psalm 51 is not even a necessary in the man-made Christianity, but this is essential. This is just part and parcel of the daily experience of biblical Christianity. So when it comes to living out repentance and faith, David gives us an inspired example of what it means for a believer to respond to his sin uh, as he is pursuing God and his revelation and his word and his way. So what I'm going to do is, for the sake of time, I know this is a, we've got 19 verses, 
and I'm just going to be up front with you, it's going to pick up pace. In other words, we're going to spend much more time on the first two stanzas, and then it's going to start picking up pace from there. Um, and so just to, to warn you, for the sake of time, I'm just going to try to read the text that we're talking about rather than read straight through Psalm 51, which, which would be excellent in and of itself. But for the sake of time, we're just going to take the text that we're looking at very, very directly. So let me just read verses 1 through 4 to begin. And um, as you see in your Bible, you have a little ins- a, a superscript there. Um, it, what's, what's helpful to remember is it, I'm looking at an NAS, and so typically you'll have like a, an, an italicized title. That's an editor adding a title for the psalm. But when the text is not in italics, starting with for the choir director, that's actually in the Hebrew text. So I'm going to go ahead and read that because that's a historical comment that's in the Hebrew text. It's not, a, it's not an editorial edition. That's actually in the original. So here's the, here's the background, the circumstances. For the choir director, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And you know the story. If, you, if you're not familiar with that story, you, need, you want to go back and read um, 2 Samuel 12, uh, 11 and 12. But basically, um, Bathsheba is bathing on the rooftop. David lives in the palace at the top of Mount Zion. He looks down the hill. He sees her bathing. He lusts after her. He summons her, commits adultery with her. And then when she gets pregnant, he sends a message to his general to leave Uriah on the front line, Bathsheba's husband. They withdraw, leave him isolated, and he is killed. And so then he can marry Bathsheba in hopes to cover up his profound sin. That's the background of the background, because the immediate background, as the, as the, circum, uh, the, the circumstantial comment here says, it's when Nathan, the prophet, came into him. And so you remember what happens. Nathan comes to David. He points the finger. He tells him the proverb of a man who owns, a, let's say, 100 sheep and one who owns one sheep, and the guy who has the 100 sheep has a guest come over, and he says, hey, give me one of your sheep, and he takes his sheep by force, and he's like, whoa, what gives? The guy's got 100, and Nathan says, that man needs to pay. David, sorry, says, that man needs to pay, and Nathan says, you're the man. We remember that Nathan says, pointing the finger at David, you are the man. Psalm 51 is David saying, I'm the man. This is, the, this is the, the expression of true repentance, a real repentance. And what's critical that you're going to see, especially in these first two stanzas here in Psalm 51, is self-indictment. There is no way any of us can follow Christ faithfully. We cannot live out repentance and faith if we are unwilling to indict ourselves. We must be able to point the indicting finger at our own heart and level biblical condemnation against the sin that still remains. When that is our habit of life, that is the proof that there is no eternal condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ because we are willing to continue to indict the sin that remains in our Christian life. Self-indictment. And that's kind of the outline for these first couple of stanzas. And so let's look, first of all, this first stanza, verses 1 through 4, is the first aspect of self-indictment, and that's Godward sorrow. Look at verses 1 through 4. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. This is a profound expression of repentance in light of the circumstances. I mean, you, you, you can imagine the, 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 the intensity of the turmoil that would come when you first start to realize what happened that got you into this circumstance. For you who are in Christ, you know exactly what that's like, even if you don't know these particular circumstances. What's interesting about the expression is that in the Hebrew, this is is very profound how it's it's written. Um, there's There's a poetic structure. So like if you've ever studied poetry, you know, there's like a, a lot of times there's like a, a pattern to the, poet, to, to the poem. In every single verse in Psalm 51 has either an, uh, either an A-B-B-A pattern or an A-B-A-B. And it's consistent all the way throughout. It's very deliberate, I'm convinced. And so David is sitting here in a moment of intense agony. 
articulating an expression of repentance that's very well thought out. This is a very sober-minded expression of repentance. It's a very sober-minded indictment of himself. It's very deliberate. So even though there's a ton of emotion involved, it's still not clouding his ability at this point to express what needs to be expressed before the Lord. Furthermore, may I may I make one more historical comment? I mean, think about the fact that we're reading this. It's in the Psalter. This is the hymn book of Israel. I mean, you want to talk about self-indictment. David says, I'm undone. I'm going to write a hymn. We're going to put it in the hymnal. And the nation's going to sing this as an expression of worship. This is profound. Profound self-indictment. David is not saving face at all. He could care less about what people think about him. He is concerned and consumed with what does God think of him, and he is gripped by what he has done. And so he begins, be gracious to me. He's pleading with God for his grace. He's begging for grace, and then in 1b, he's begging for God to blot out his transgressions. This is an ABBA verse, and what's interesting is, in, and it's translated perfectly in the NAS, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. And so it's according to the character of God in the middle that is kind of encapsulated in this little chiasm. So he's, he's pointing to the character of God. In line with your loving kindness, in line with how massive your compassion is, that's why I'm appealing to you to be gracious to me and to blot out my transgression. Spurgeon said, this is the same as praying, act, O Lord, like yourself. <laughs> That's such a sweet prayer. God, would you just go ahead and act like who you are? Because I'm just appealing to you as a filthy sinner here. I'm appealing to you on the basis that you are infinitely loving kind, you have infinite loving kindness, and you have this magnanimous compassion. David is appealing to God for forgiveness, not primarily because David needs it, but primarily because God is glorified in giving it. How profound is that act of repentance right there? It's an act of repentance that's primarily Godward, not even man-centered. Let me show you another example of that real quick. Look at Psalm 25. Uh, this is one of those verses that just has continued to minister to me through the years. First of all, in verse 7, David writes, Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. So in line with how loving kind you are, I want you to remember me in line with that attribute. Consistent with that attribute, Lord, view me through that lens. And then he says this, For your goodness sake, O Lord. What does that even mean? For the sake of your goodness, God, would you view me that way? Because I have nothing to appeal to except the basis of your character. I can't say, forgive me because I deserve it. I can't say, forgive me because I at least did something else to make up for it. I can't say it on any other basis than on the simple fact that you'd get glory for your name because you'd show yourself as good to your world, to your creation. Look at verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity for it's great. I mean, what an expression that is. This is an expression of repentance. It's asking God for grace and forgiveness because, not first and foremost because I need it, and we all do, first and foremost because it would be for your namesake, God. Here's the, here's, here's the offer, Lord. I got an offer for you. I bring this whole massive mountain of liability, this heap of guilt I've done nothing but fling mud at your glory, and I am infinitely guilty for that. So let me, let me just bring all of the crime, all the guilt, and the sentence and the liability to this equation. And then you can just wipe it out for the sake of showing how great and how good you are. I mean, the appeal is so God-centered, and that doesn't let up. All the way through this stanza, everything is God-centered. It's a sorrow because his grief, his 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 sin, his crime, his guilt is against God. And so verse 2, in Psalm, back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 2, he says, 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Notice, this, this cuts through so much pretense. Notice there's nothing here about the actions. There's nothing here about the, the externals. He's asking God for internal cleansing. I mean, this is a, this is a Godward sorrow because he, he, he's, it, it's like, I, have you ever changed your clothes in the middle of the, middle of the day? You, you probably have done that because you realize, hmm, this isn't, this isn't going well. I need to change my clothes. You, uh, you, you, maybe, you, maybe you had a day off and so you went running in the middle of the day and uh, in, in Arizona, you're going you're gonna to smell a certain way after running in the middle of the day, right? And so you have to change your clothes. Or you, you ate lunch and you got to go meet somebody and you got spaghetti sauce all over your shirt. Now, that's not going to go well, so you change clothes. You, you don't need clean laundry unless you're aware that it's dirty. But the, the laundry analogy doesn't quite work because that's still external. And so Spurgeon said it this way, that the hypocrite is content if his garments be washed, but the true beggar cries, wash me, wash me. You see, it's, it's easy in, in a religious context to imagine that we're following Christ because we're trying to um, keep up an appearance. But the issue is, what's, what's on the inside? Is there Godward sorrow about where we've grieved God on the inside? Because David is, David is aware that I need cleansing in the innermost being. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. You ever, uh, you ever done a paint project, you know, and don't use the roller, and you, you go out to clean out the roller? You can kind of hose it out. But then, you know, like what I like to do is just get the, like a high-pressure nozzle on the, on, the, on the roller, and you get it going, you get it spinning really fast, and all of a sudden, like, more paint comes out, and you think it looks clean, and then you dig it back in the bucket, and you start squeezing it, and there's more paint coming out, and you spray it, and you get dry it with the pressure washer, and it spins faster. It's just incredible. It's like you see, you see what's on the inside of the roller when it spins fast, and when you squeeze it and press it, and you, what, what's on the inside comes out. If our view of repentance is external... We'll have a superficial repentance. We'll have a superficial expression of need. We'll believe that we just need to be to clean up the external, the behavior. David says, I need to be washed. I need to be cleansed. He's viewing himself as the paint roller, and he's not satisfied with looking clean. He's not satisfied until he is clean, until God has washed him. And if it was just an external issue, he wouldn't even need to ask the Lord. He knows he is in territory. He has need that goes beyond his ability, and so he's looking to God to wash him and to cleanse him. In verse 3 and 4, this really gets to the root cause of repentance. There's two real root causes of repentance. Number one, awareness of sin, and number two, awareness of the offended party. Look at verse 3. For I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. I mean, David is so radically aware of his transgressions, plural, and his sin, singular. And the difference is important. Notice in verse 3, I know my transgressions. Those are individual acts where David has crossed the line of God's revealed will. He's aware. He's, he's so aware. There's so many times where I, here's the line God revealed in his word, and I've just, sometimes I just did a long jump, dove right over that thing. <laughs> sometimes I kind of step, stepped up next to the line, just stuck my toe over the line. Sometimes I didn't even know what I was doing, and I kind of just got some biblical clarity, and all of a sudden I looked, oh, wait, I'm way past the line. He's aware of all these individual acts of transgressions, plural. And he's also very aware of his, 3B, sin, singular. That's interesting. He's not only aware of the individual acts, he's aware of also this root cause, his sin nature, his sin in the abstract form, not sins in the sense of acts committed. That would be much like the transgressions of 3A. This is the nature of sin. I remember when I was converted, and one of the things that impressed me was just, I was very aware of tr some transgressions. There was some, there was clear areas, just massive areas my, my whole life, as far as anything that I knew from God's word, my life lived outside of that. And so I was very aware of my transgressions. And what, what was interesting was it didn't take long for the Lord to start showing me that even worse than my transgressions was my sin, that at the core of who I was, I was a sinner, and all the transgressions were was the proof of what was on the inside. 
If, there's, if we're going to live out our repentance and our faith, we're aware that the problem is our sin and our sin nature that produced those transgressions. And I'll just say this too, just if this is helpful, believer. We need to constantly equip ourselves to think biblically about our sin. I just never cease to amaze myself (laughs) at how wicked my sin is. But I should never be surprised because the Bible is so clear. In fact, I don't want to summarize it. I want to read it to you. I'm going to read to you Psalm 36. Listen to what Psalm 36 says about the effect of sin on the, on the, in the ungodly. Psalm 36, verses 1 and 2. Here's, here's what sin will do to you. Sin will ruin your ability to do what David does in Psalm, Psalm 51, verse 3. It will inhibit you and prevent you entirely from your awareness of sin. Look at verse 1. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. So transgression is whispering into his heart, in his inner man, whispering in his ear. And here's what, here's what it does. Verse 2, it flatters him in his own eyes. Transgression is telling the ungodly person, hey, you're not that bad. Hey, you've got this. Hey, you're okay. Sometimes it might take on various methodologies. Sometimes there's various tactics. I mean, there's probably, for if there's, if there's 500 sinners in this room right now, there's probably... 3,000 tactics that are very common to us is how sin would, would flatter us. And of course, this is talking about the ungodly person. But for the believer even, sin will still try the same tactic. And we can still fall prey to it, even if it doesn't characterize our lives. And sometimes we just imagine, oh, that was circumstances that played into that. That wasn't really because it came out of my heart. I was forced there. We find all sorts of ways to excuse ourselves and blame someone else and flatter ourselves in our sin. But then watch this. If that's not bad enough, it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. One of sin's most twisted and perverted symptoms is that it blinds the sinner from even seeing his sin. It makes him complacent about his own sin. David says, I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Let me just ask you real quick right now. Let me pause real quick on Psalm 51. Ask yourself this question. If you had to just sit down at the end of the service and write a one-page paper, just put it on paper, if you had to write that out, what is my front-burner issue right now? What sin is the most urgent sin that's plaguing me right now? Or maybe you have to word it this way. If the Lord were to say that you are going to turn away from the faith by next year, what sin would have got you there? Could you tell me? Are you clear to yourself what that is? Do you know your sin? Is it ever before you? If you are not aware of your sin, you are not spiritually healthy. You're in a very dangerous spot right now. David's very aware of his transgression. His sin is ever before him. And that's critical. That's a root cause of real repentance, is an awareness of sin. The second root cause of sin is awareness of the offended party. And look at where he goes in verse 4. Against you... You only I have sinned and have done what is evil in your sight. People have struggled with this, and I understand why. You think, David, how could you possibly say that? I mean, you've sinned against Bathsheba. You've sinned against Uriah. You've sinned against your army. You've sinned against your nation. You've sinned against your wife. I mean, what in the words? the end? It's just like the line of people he's sinned against horizontally is pretty long. But... And David's not denying that he's sinned against people by saying that. What he is saying is he's highlighting the focal point that he is aware that his sin is against God alone in the sense that he's the, he's the one who's been offended. He's the one who's had a crime committed against is God. If God has been offended by me, by my nature, and by my actions, then what does it matter that I've sinned against other fellow specks of dust on the earth? 
he's really starting to see it properly. He's putting it in his proper perspective. And this is a awareness that God has been offended by my, by my sin. And when you start thinking about it that way, you start, you start putting it in his proper perspective about the gravity of what we've done. I remember reading a, a, a book by Jonathan Edwards. I don't even remember which work it was, but I remember uh, reading a, a book where he was describing um, the nature of guilt. And he used the mathematical equation or uh, uh, comparison. You know, if you, if you think about like a, you know, like back to geometry class, like a line segment has two points, a ray has one point with an arrow going one direction, but then a line has arrows going both directions. Okay, remember that whole discussion? So a line goes both directions without stopping. So if you think about it this way, it doesn't really matter the scope of the sin if that line is a sin. It doesn't really matter the width of that line. It's always a line because you've sinned against a holy God. It goes infinitely in both directions, and so the guilt associated with any sin is infinite. And I remember being struck by that. Any wayward thought, inclination, desire in my heart, any thought thunk in my mind that's not true and a corollary to what God says in his word is so far beneath him as to insult him to make me infinitely guilty because that's a crime against him. Against God, God only I have sinned. You know, Christian, I want to just speak to you really directly here. We've looked at three and a half verses of an expression of repentance, how to deal with sin post-conversion. And I want to ask you if you're weary. I want to ask you if you feel like you're failing and you feel like, man, I, I think I turned from my sin, but it just doesn't seem to let up. It's just ever in front of me. I feel like I'm constantly in failure. You're, 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 you might be thinking half straight, but you're, you're, there's, there, there's a potential that you could go a detour and you could actually take that as, okay, yeah, I'm just going to constantly fail. I'm going to keep trusting. And you start emphasizing faith minus the repentance. Don't do that. Don't do that. But I want to give you hope because biblical repentance leads to such profound joy. And I do not want any Christian here just drowning in the misery of perpetual failure because you haven't seen how profound the impact of repentance really is. There's a co connection between 4a and 4b that just it needs to be understood by everyone. Notice 4b starts with, so that. Specifically, it says, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. What, what, what David is saying here is he's making a connection of cause and effect that from 3a through 4a, that whole discussion about his awareness of his sins, his awareness of the fact that he's aware that how he sinned, what his sins are, that it comes from his sin nature, and that it's against God and God alone, all of that whole part of the equation produces this result that he actually gets to the point where he starts to declare God righteous when God speaks, and the idea here is a word of judgment. Because notice what he says, you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. You're not repentant until you get to the point where you would say to God, God, for that thought that I just had right there, that harsh word right there, that season of, of uh, uh, personal ambition over here, that one act, that one thought is so insulting to your righteousness and your glory that if you were to condemn me for that one thought, you'd be right to do so. The, the repentance declares God right to do that. You would be righteous. And I, I remember seeing battles, knock down, drag out, battles with sin, and just thinking, man, something must be wrong here. Something must be wrong. I got so much help from this verse. I remember thinking, you ever had, you ever had a moment where you see sin and you, you, you kind of confess it? You kind of do like a token confession, like, oh, that's, yeah, that's bad. Oh, man. Hey, Lord, that's really bad. And you move on your way and it seems like the next, it seems like in the same minute, you're right back there 
whether it's anxiety or lust or pride or you, any, any love of the world that you could possibly list that's described in Scripture, any one of them will do. You could have actually acknowledged, yep, there it was, oh, I'm really bad. Okay, let's do better. And then boom, right back on your face. Seems like maybe not the minute, maybe, maybe a minute's flattering to myself. How about the same second? It's like in a nanosecond. I mean, let's just be honest. I know that my heart is so corrupt that I am capable of dishonoring the Lord in egregious ways in a nanosecond of fleshly thinking. And I remember just despairing, thinking, man, Lord, I, I, I'm trying to repent here. I feel like I can't even get back on the straight and narrow. I'm like, How do I walk in a way that's pleasing to you? It seems like I can see something wrong and then just act like it never happened and just go right back down that same path. Do you ever do that when you're driving sometimes? Or you get familiar with the lay of the land? And, uh, you know, like I used to, uh, in our old house, there was a spot on the freeway where you just get over and it's like, this is my exit. And if I was ever visiting somebody on the other side of town, I would always take the wrong exit. I'd have to get off and I'm like, oh, now I'm going the wrong direction. I have to get off and turn around. It's like I just got in the habit. Like I don't even have to think about it. It's just getting off on my exit, going my direction is just habitual. If that starts to become reality with sin, it can be really despairing. Because all you have to do is do nothing, and you find yourself back in that same front burner bosom sin. And so at this point, now you're on the verge of being tempted to think, man, the gospel's broken. It's not even giving me any power over sin. I'm just failing constantly. Where, does that, where, do, I, where do I find hope here? You find hope in 4B. You find hope in going back to the truth that what you are doing is so wicked and so corrupt that if God were to speak a condemnation against you for that action or he were to judge you for that sin, he would be blameless to do so. What does that do for your conscience? You see what that does for your conscience? That starts fortifying you as you walk the Christian life. It's fortifying you because you are building up protection and a barrier to keep you on the straight and narrow. So if I use the, the freeway analogy, I've, I've done this a lot in counseling. I'll just say, like, look, you keep taking this, this exit, and it's habitual. But now you're starting to realize, hey, this is a bad exit. It doesn't go anywhere. It's like, so, so what you're doing is you're putting a sign up that says bridge out. And you're putting up some Bob's Barricades with the little blinking lights. And you're putting those along the, 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 the little uh, side of the freeway. And then you're, you're putting up the concrete um, barriers so that you can't even turn that way. So if even you tried, you just scrape up the front fender. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I've already... That's what it is to say to the Lord, that single thought, that inclination is so wicked that you should, for the sake of your righteousness, judge me for it. You are pouring... Uh, barriers in your conscience. You're putting barriers in your conscience for your Christian walk so that you don't go back down those paths. That's how you build up sensitivity. What's your conscience do with that? You don't just glibly pass over that like, wow, I just lived what deserved an infinite amount of wrath. Okay, let's go do it again. Thank you, I'll have another. You just reinforce your conscience right there by speaking truth to your conscience about the character of God as it pertains to your sin. That's the connection between the so that and 4A and 4B. Well, we got to move on to this next stanza. And I said we'll be quick on the last two. We might even get to the last two. Um, let's see what we get. Let's see how far we get here. Living out repentance and faith, we, we must indict ourselves. And in verses 1 through 4, we, we see how David models Godward sorrow. In 5 through 9, we see how David shows us that he's aware of his lack of inward purity. The need here is inward purity, inner purity, and that's his desire. Without this desire, there's no repentance. Look at verse 5 and 6. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Okay, very obvious observation. Verse 5 starts with behold. Verse 6 starts with behold. And that's just the Hebrew, like, look, look at this. Like, wow. Verse 5 highlights David's nature. Verse 6 highlights David's nature as God desires it to be. You see the contrast here? Verse 5, I was brought forth in iniquity. I mean, one should be shocked at the true view of our own nature. We must see our, our nature for what it is. Um, 
We were brought forth in iniquity, and then in sin my mother conceived me. And now that's not talking about his mother's sin, as though it was a sinful act. It's talking about he, he himself being conceived in sin. So he wasn't sinful from childhood. He wasn't sinful from birth. He was sinful from conception. He was sinful from the womb. He goes on to talk about that in Psalm 58. I was a, a liar. You know, the wicked are estranged from, from the womb. Liars are, are a liars from birth. Uh, even before we lack the ability to tell lies, we're liars by nature. That's what he's pointing out in verse 5. Look at this. This is who I am by nature. I'm so corrupt that it's natural to me. But then look at this, verse 6. You, God, you desire truth in the innermost being. God wants truth to be reigning in the innermost man. He wants truth to dwell there, to rest there, to reign there. And in the hidden parts, he wants to show the sinner, the follower, those who follow him, he wants to show them wisdom. You see, the trans, you see how, how opposite this is, and you also see how hopeless it becomes to actually repent and believe and to follow Christ in the way without renewed thinking. Without truth in the innermost man, we can't follow Christ rightly. Without truth in the innermost man, we will deceive ourselves every time. We need truth from God outside of ourselves to show us how to repent. I think um, one of those knockdown, drag out battles was several years ago, I remember, with, with a particular form of, of selfish ambition. And I remember uh, seeing it, I could see it, I could recognize it, you know, a mile away. I had, by God's grace, I had, had sensitivities that started seeing this manifestation of selfish ambition. And, and so, you know, being the good Christian, I mean, I'm a pastor after all. Being the good Christian that I am, I said, okay, we gotta, we're going to knock that thing out. We just, we're muscling this thing down. Gonna, it's just, we've got we to deal heavy, heavy artillery on this sin. We're just going to nail it. And so I just remember for week after week after week, what became month after month after month, just striving with all of my might and with all of my main to put this sin down. And I was flexing Herculean type of effort to fling everything I had at this sin, and it just sat there and just laughed at me. Just laughed. Yeah, that's all you got. I remember I was... I went on a jog, I was running, I was listening to a sermon, and it was interesting, I don't, I don't even remember what the sermon was, um, and it didn't have anything to do with my particular issue. I just remember thinking about truth as I was running, probably the echo of the sermon that I was supposed to be listening to, and I was literally, there's this little bridge by, where I was running across, and it was, probably, it was probably like a 40-foot bridge, it's pretty short, and I, I entered that bridge literally in this state of confusion, in this hopelessness to, to actually see uh, deliverance. And by the time I got to the other side of the bridge, it was like the Lord had completely set me free. What had happened? Some sort of emotional experience? No. Some sort of sign in heaven? No. What happened was truth had begun to reign in my innermost being along these lines. John, are you so arrogant to think that you could produce repentance on your own? You just turned repentance into a work. Of course you're going to fail. That's where David's at. David has given up trying to be the self-made man, and he's looking to the Lord. He's looking to the Lord. Notice he compares his nature that as his fallen nature and then the nature that God desires. He, he desires truth in my innermost being and it's not there naturally. So he turns to the Lord, verse 7, Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I mean, this is where, this is where David goes. David finally stops looking at himself and he starts looking at the Lord. And hyssop is a... Uh, Obviously, it's a plant that was used to sprinkle blood. It was used at Passover to sprinkle the lamb's blood on the, on the doorpost and on the header. Um, it's, it's interesting, in, Luke 14, uh, in Leviticus 14 and Numbers 19, it's described as being the very thing that would uh, cleanse um, the sinner when the blood was applied. 
What David is praying for here is the internal reality pictured by the hyssop in the sacrificial system. He's asking for himself to be purified internally with hyssop, and then he'll be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. This is internal cleansing, internal transformation. I remember, um, I remember when I was a college student, you know, lived in Chicago, and I remember how dirty the city seemed to a farm boy from western Kansas, and uh, snow would fall, and I remember watching the, the snow just cover everything, and it just turned a dirty city just brilliant white. I just remember being so impressed. Wow, that is amazing. I walked into class. I walked out of class two hours later, and then in two hours, it was brown. It was just sludge. It was nasty. There was grime from the road and the air and pollution and smog and everything else. And I thought, you know, that's, that's actually a helpful picture of self-made repentance versus Godward repentance. We can try to produce repentance all we want. It's going to be nothing more than a human effort trying to accomplish righteousness. We can cover up what's on the inside with changes on the outside, and that's going to be nothing more than sprinkling snow over a grimy, filthy heart. But when God cleanses the heart, then there's true change. There's true change in the behavior because there's been true change in the nature. Finally, look at verses 8 and 9. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Notice the coupling here of joy with the removal of sin. This is a true spiritual joy. That, uh, it, this is true Christianity. This is true righteousness. Is when your, your guilt against God has been taken away. You, you know that there are certain things that no one on the face of the planet will ever know about. But God knows about everything. And when your crimes against God have been taken away by God, and the God who sees all, who examines the, 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 the heart, says there's nothing here to see, what kind of joy does that produce? That's the joy of repentance. Well, David describes Godward sorrow and his need for inward purity, and, and that's really what, what, what describes this self-indictment in verses 1 through 9. We'll let, next time, we'll have to pick it up in verses 10 to 19 and look at this plea for restoration. And we'll see there how this is how he becomes useful to the Lord and, and pleasing to the Lord. But we'll stop there. But hopefully this is helpful just as a template to think about, as a believer, what does it mean to live out faith and repentance as described by Jesus in his earthly ministry. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for um, Psalm 51. I I just thank you even for the inspired example that David became for us. Um, Even the the misery of all the sin that he committed and the misery of uh, the wrestling of the conscience that he experienced, all of that was a, in, in your providence, it was a grace for us as we are so uh, eager for, for an inspired example of what it means to, to really deal with sin, to walk in faith and repentance. And so, Lord, I thank you for the clarity of your word. I, and again, I just want to pray that it would be a protection for every believer here in this room, uh, that we would not wallow or in the misery of, of um, an, an, an assumption about faith, an assumption that faith just believes, I guess it'll get better, or that you just made everything right and nothing needs to change. I pray that there would be a real repentance and a real faith, because they always go together. I pray that the real faith would be proven by a real repentance, and that though we uh, never, we of course never reach perfection, Lord, I just pray that every believer in here would be refreshed by the real prospect of actually following you in the path, of actually yielding their will to you and actually stepping where you tell them to step, of actually saying no to those sins that would lay them aside. And Lord, I also just want to pray for any unbeliever in the room who maybe hears this and thinks this doesn't even apply to me. This isn't, this isn't my experience at all. I just, I just pray that you would show them their, their need, that that, that individual is, is, is even outside of your kingdom and they're not in your family. Lord, your message to all was repent and believe the gospel of God. Uh, Thank you so much for being a gracious and compassionate God who is so quick to wipe out massive debts, debts as large as ours. 
And yet, as massive as those debts are, they pale in comparison to the, the grace and righteousness revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this word, and I pray that it would be a blessing and a source of joy for us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.